Good morning. Welcome to day four of our day, the 14th annual summit. And uh, I'm delighted that everybody was able to get up so early this morning and that uh, Jeffrey Sachs has been able to join us all the way, I believe, from Norway? Wow. So that's a long flight, and it's amazing that uh, we are now <clears throat> uh, so far advanced uh, into uh, the, new, the new world <laughs> since November 8th. Seem, seems like it's, it's been a couple of years to me, but um, things have changed quite dynamically. And, and, and I just want to mention that the last time that I saw uh, Jeff speak was in Hawaii at IUCN. And that was an extraordinary meeting before the November elections where we were looking really at some serious solutions, 10,000 people gathered in Hawaii to really take a deep look at the situation in the oceans. And even President Obama came by and dedicated an enormous uh, sanctuary at the Papahanaumokuakea Kea in Midway Island. Since then, it seems we've lost some, some uh, momentum but I just want to mention that there's a note of hope with some of the recent political movements in France and England, and perhaps that is even going to uh, come across, across the Atlantic Ocean. Maybe, uh, maybe Jeff has brought some of that over with him from Norway. So um, I'm delighted to introduce Mr. Sachs. He is one of the preeminent thinkers in our country. We're very, very fortunate to have him. And um, uh, Please join us at the podium and uh, look forward to your remarks very much. Well, the main thing they want to know in Norway is what's going on here. Uh, honestly, uh, they can't figure it out, and I would say that that's the uh, general, uh, general view around the world. I'm, I'm in approximately one different country every day. Uh, in my life as uh, working uh, for the Secretary General of the UN, so I get to hear a lot of international reaction, and uh, the main international reaction is that they're counting on the United States not to fall off the edge of the world and uh, not to be a renegade country and actually to get our act together. And uh, that's really what, what we need to do. Uh, we're not we're not doing it uh, right now. So it's a pretty serious uh, situation. And I want to just spend a few minutes. This is a room of experts and, uh, and advocates. So I'd like to speak just for a few minutes and then entertain some thoughts. And uh, you can give me some advice also. And maybe I can give you some advice uh, so that we can be more effective. I just saw on the CNN. Uh, ticker that the Republican leadership will reveal to the Republican members the content of the health care draft legislation. Okay. This is sick. This is not normal. This is not democratic. This is not any way that our $20 trillion economy can function. This is really pathetic. You can't take the largest sector of the U.S. economy and without one hour of testimony, one draft, not to mention a white paper, an analytical study, make fundamental changes that affect tens of millions of people and call that normal, democratic, or in the least bit functional. This is a system out of control right now. It violates every standard of rationality. Rationality means you have objectives and you study all the possible alternatives to reach those objectives. You analyze them, you assess uncertainties, you assess where you need to invest in more effort to 
understand the system better. You take policy decisions that are based on meeting objectives. You have an adaptive system so that over time it adjusts to the realities which are never fully understood at the beginning. And frankly, for the world that we have right now, which is seven and a half billion people, a $127 trillion world economy, armed to the teeth at the edge of environmental catastrophe, if we are not rational, <laughs> there's no chance that we're actually going to make it through. The system is not rational in that sense at all right now in our country. Why? My proposition is that it's profoundly corrupt and that it's broken and that it's mainly about vested interests and money and that the money is so big and the greed is so insatiable in some quarters that they are ready to break this system. I put David and Charles Koch as number one and number two on the list. Completely disgusting. If they had stopped at renovating the uh, opera house, that would be fine. But what they're doing is wrecking this country. And it's been systematic, and it's been a quarter century now. And we take it as normal. It's not normal. It's completely dysfunctional. What's happening with this health care bill? This is purely a bill designed to get the tax cut agenda advanced. It's to save a certain amount so that under reconciliation, the next step can be taken, which is the be all and end all dream of these people, that we can have no government and no taxes. And this is just a piece of it. And if there's roadkill in the way of 23 million people off the health care rolls, screw it. Because they didn't even pause for a moment when CBO scored this bill. Didn't even matter. Our slightly befuddled uh, president, who's a very confused man, a bit out of his element, said, this is mean, but it doesn't stop anything. Because the agenda, by the way, is not with Trump. The agenda is far beyond Trump. Trump is an ignorant man implementing this agenda. But the Republican leadership, I'm sorry to say, is in the hands of such big money and such vulgarity that we do not have rational processes in this country. If you read the president's statement about getting out of Paris, you cannot even map this into coherence. It's a string of lies. It has nothing to do with the Paris Climate Agreement. They're laughing at us. This is an anti-American agreement. But I don't think it's fantasy world. What I do think is that the 22 Republican senators that wrote to the president the week before explain this. Those are not 22 senators in fantasy. Those are 22 senators on the take of the oil and gas lobby, pure and simple. So what's the game? The game is we need to frack as much as possible and get your goddamn hands off of my right to frack. That's what this is about. If the world's ruined, if diplomacy's ruined, doesn't matter. Grow up. That's what this is about. Well, it's going to get us in a hell of a lot of trouble. And we're not fighting it, and we're not winning this battle, by the way. And I really, it's nice that 1,200 cities and 
university signed something. That's a reflection of a basic fact, which is that these policies are not in the name of the American people. They're not reflective of public opinion. They're not reflective of polling data. They're not reflective of anything except a narrow range of special interests. So that part is fine. But having a letter with 1,200 signatures is not winning. And this change is not going to happen by itself, the one that we need. And the American economy is not going to decarbonize on its own. And the renewable energies are not just going to beat out the others on their own, though close in some cases. My proposition is that there's enough low-cost coal, oil, and gas around to absolutely wreck the world. So however good and however much you do on other areas, there are enough proved reserves of coal, oil, and gas that will be burned unless we decide not to do it. And so that means, in my opinion, this is not about a market contest. This is about politics. And politics has two forms. One is the corrupt, call it Machiavellian form, you're just in it to win. And the other for me, which I like, is the Aristotelian form, that politics is something about the common good and we're actually trying to defend the common interest. There's nothing in this about scientific debate. And so every time that somebody says it, they just are wasting your time. It's not worth spending one moment on the scientific debate with these ignoramuses. They're not ignoramuses with these corrupt forces. Rather than debate the science, ask them who pays you. Because that's what this is about. The science is fine. It's all over our universities. It's all over our government. There's no problem with the science. Of course, it needs to be improved. There are uncertainties. There need to be new studies. That's why it's not such a great idea to slash the budget of every research uh, institution that can do this, but that's part of their political game. After Trump made this speech, Nikki Haley, of all people, God knows why her, came out and said, uh, oh, no, no, he believes in climate change. So I wrote, well, that makes him absolutely, uh, literally a sociopath. It would be better if he was as ignorant and stupid as he looks. But if he actually believes in it, then he's purely sociopathic because that's the deliberate infliction of harm without remorse, which is what this really is. So to my mind, we're in a battle. And the time is really short. And the battle in this era and this subject which I'll take broadly as protecting not only the climate system, but also biodiversity, which is on the verge of mass extinctions all over the world, is different from earlier battles like acid rain or noxes and soxes or other pollutants, in that here we're talking about irreversibilities. And we're just at the edge of massive irreversibilities. When the species are gone, they don't come back. When we tip the climate to the point where the ice sheets disintegrate and we have several meters sea level rise, it's not coming back. When we have enough droughts, as we do in many of the dryland parts of the world, that we end up with a 10,000 kilometer belt from Bamako, Mali to Kabul in flames, which is basically what we have right now. Because you just go across the whole dryland field. It's war. People are hungry. Crops are failing. Surface water is drying up. Dust storms are everywhere. I've been in them. I've seen them. I was in Tehran where you could barely 
look ahead because of the dust coming in from Iraq. So what do we need to do? Well, obviously sell $110 billion of arms. That'll solve that problem. Because what's that about? That's the other lobby that matters so much. The preeminent world's arms sales, as our idiotic president said in signing $110 billion of arms, jobs, jobs, jobs. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a failure of imagination. To think that's the only way you make jobs is for Americans to work on the Middle East to create the end of the world. I looked at this Georgia race yesterday, and you look at Ryan's pack, and you look at the money behind, behind Ryan's pack that funded Handel. Well, it's all of these companies. And it's my favorite neighbors in New York, the hedge fund industry. God, they have money to give away. And they have money to give away because even though they don't outperform the market, they sure have every tax break in the world. And Ryan's going to keep it for them. And so we're in a kind of equilibrium that is uh, a trajectory which is uh, locally on course for massive disaster. So what should we be doing? The first thing is we should be thinking as a country, thinking and planning. So let me introduce my favorite word, planning. It's a word that went out with the communist era. We can't plan, that's communism. Well, we need to plan. There is no way to decarbonize an economy without a tremendous amount of forward planning. Which kinds of energy systems are going to be allowed? What about nuclear? What about placement of wind and solar? Where are the new power lines going to go? What about pumped hydro storage? Who's going to build the infrastructure? Are the cities going to be prepared for electric vehicles? Are there other options? I co-chair an advisory committee for New York City on this. What I can tell you is these questions were never asked and to this day have not been thoroughly analyzed. And that's for a pretty sophisticated city, I would say. And by the way, once you pull the thread, then of course New York City buys from the grid so we're talking about New York State, we're talking about the U.S. Northeast, we're talking about a configuration that requires a level of planning far beyond what a city can do in any event. And when I called NYSERDA, which is a wonderful agency, and I said, what are the projections for 2050 for how to get to the state's goals on deep decarbonization, they said, Mr. Sachs, we've never planned beyond 2030. We have no plans. And why is that? Because if you're only planning energy, not planning carbon, you don't need to plan beyond 2030. The game of the public utilities has been to make sure that you can meet peak demand. And they're good at that. They plan. They project population, economic change, energy use in the future. They don't get it all right, but they plan but they plan 15 years out, and then they look at where they can get incremental load. But we need to do something else. We need a much deeper systems transformation, and that requires planning at a time scale of 35 to 50 years. With all of the technological uncertainties at decision nodes, and when you're planning in a stochastic, adaptive, nonlinear system like the real world, you also plan how to learn. Where should we invest? What are our R&D priorities in order to get reach decision nodes at the right level? Do we need to completely overhaul the internal combustion engine economy? 
Well, it's possible that we could continue with internal combustion engines, but only if we're using synthetic fuels. So you could use them if we're harvesting synthetic hydrocarbons by renewable energy. That's one possible pathway. But Elon Musk's pathway is better batteries, which seems pretty plausible and probably the one closer to reach if we're looking at a time horizon of the next 15 years. We need to plan. I went to the White House in the Obama administration and I said, and a very senior official came up to me and said, Jeff, do you know anything about electric vehicles? And I was a little dumbfounded being in the White House, being asked the question by a senior official. And I said, well, yeah, I know something. Well, well can you give us some, some links? I said, are you kidding? You guys are the White House. You have the National Academy of Engineering down the block. Could you hire them to give you a comprehensive white paper on transport alternatives? Oh, that's so complicated. Well, what is that about? That's also about lobbying. Why don't we think? Because our legislation is written in back rooms by corporate lobbyists. It's not written by the world's leading scientists and engineers, at least one of whom is here, Klaus Lochner, you're going to hear from uh, shortly. It's written by lobbyists. Who wrote this health legislation? This is the game that we're playing. So I think we have a real fight ahead. And uh, we better join it seriously. I want to call it what it is. This is corruption. This is a collapse of our political system. This is money mindlessly driving 325 million Americans, 16% of the world economy, in an absolutely drunken race down this road. We don't know where we're going. We have no plans. We're supposed to build a trillion dollars of infrastructure on the basis of tweets. What the hell are we doing? And what I can tell you is, since I travel to the universities and colleges across this country, we have more depth of knowledge. We have a deeper bench. We have more expertise. And it's in every state and in every con congressional district than any other country in the whole world in our 3,000 institutions of higher education. Astounding capacity. And some honest politicians ought to go visit their colleges and universities and talk to people who know what the hell they're doing, rather than the lobbyists pouring into their backroom meetings. So that's what I propose, that we actually call this for what it is, that we point fingers, that we tell the Koch brothers, get the hell out of our government. that we explain to young people what's going on, why they better become experts in these areas, because this is a complicated agenda, that we get behind candidates, both Democrats and Republicans. I am the least partisan. I just hate idiocy, because it's dangerous. Because I got three grandchildren now, and I see the kind of danger that this idiocy is making. So I'm happy to elect Republicans. I'm happy to elect Democrats. But I want to elect candidates that tell the truth and that are off the big money because it's disgusting. It's demeaning. And we're alone in the high-income world. And we're basically alone in the world with our broken and corrupted political system. And while we're at it, let's figure out how we make a consumer boycott on Georgia Pacific products owned by the Koch brothers. No more of their products because we got to hit them where it hurts. Thank you very much.
please. Yes, thank you. Your, hold on, microphone. Here it comes. Okay, thanks very much. Your analysis is stunning. And my question is, I'm an activist, a climate activist, and um, my question is, how do we plan to plan? So what does, what does it look like? We've got these 3,000 universities. We've got some think tanks. We've got huge amount of organizing and, and stuff going on. I mean, this whole conference has been a gathering of extraordinary things. What makes that into the kind of movement you're talking about because it would be a movement that serves everybody's interests? Yeah. How does that become the lobby? And just one more thing, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby recently hit the New York Times with their approach to lobbying where they go in and they actually are non-confrontational and, and provide information in a way that uh, a lot of conservative representatives are, are welcoming because suddenly coming, someone's coming in to be informational rather than confrontational. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to have to both be informational and confrontational. We're fighting some very powerful forces. They're very greedy. I happen to uh, have a dinner with uh, some of them on occasion uh, in New York. God, they love money. Uh, it's insane in my view. Uh, but they're ready to wreck this country for the sake of uh, money. And so I don't think it's uh, only information. They're playing games. We know that Exxon has known for 40 years uh, what's going on. But for 39 years, it funded a bunch of creeps who would say anything. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute is beyond the pale. The Chamber of Commerce, absolutely unacceptable. I tried to get some big companies to state things before the Paris Climate Agreement. They wouldn't do it. Why? Not because they didn't believe it, but because they're aiming for their corporate tax cuts, so they didn't want to antagonize their political colleagues. So there's a tremendous amount of dishonesty out there. Of course, it's also true that people need information. <laughs> Somebody wrote to me, sent me a, 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 an alternative uh, news website. You know, Mr. Sachs, you don't know X, Y, and Z sent me a website. It had some institute that I had never heard of, so I, uh, of course, uh, Googled it, and it didn't exist. So I wrote back to the gentleman, said, uh, please uh, give me the address so I can contact them. He wrote back, are you calling me a liar? Here are more facts. Uh, and uh, then I wrote back, and I said, well, uh, no, that's not actually right. And if you look at uh, this NOAA thing, uh, um, it, you know, this is not, not correct, uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. And he wrote back with one more blast, and I was, okay, I had, uh, had my tie amusement, and I wrote back, said, uh, well, maybe you would enjoy going to your local college nearby and talking to somebody there. And he said, I tried that, Mr. Sachs. They all talk like you do. Uh, so, uh, uh, Okay, that's a problem, but what I would do is invite every congressman to visit their local universities in their district and have a session with their local universities because there isn't one in this country that is going to spout nonsense because by the time you're a PhD scientist or engineer, you know what you're talking about. So I'm not prescribing any curriculum. I'm just saying go talk to your universities. They have to be proud of their universities. We should get organized to help universities have teach-ins for Congress. Right. Yeah? I'm ready to help you do that. I'm ready to help you do that. So some good activist here, call me. My email address, by the way, is sachs at columbia.edu. I had to negotiate very hard for a simple email address. No numbers. 
No mixed letters, numbers, underscores. That was the terms for coming to Columbia. Uh, so I, I want you to use that address. Uh, and uh, if you have ideas, I'm, uh, I want to be engaged and to help you. And let me say on the goal setting, we need goals. We, you know, everywhere I go, I was at this conference in Trondheim yesterday, it was John F. Kennedy said, we'll go to the moon and back. I use that all the time because for me, that was my childhood, was the moonshot, the most inspiring, conceivable part of the moonshot. And I was just with two moonwalkers uh, yesterday uh, that, were, that were at the conference uh, together who had been on the Apollo uh, missions uh, on the moon. That's the excitement for our country, that we, we could decarbonize our energy system in 20 years if we tried. I'll give us to mid-century. But we need some national goals. U.S. emissions down by 50% by 2030, 90% by 2050. We can do that. If a president stood and said, that's what we should do, we want infrastructure second to none in the world. We want to be the world leaders so that we're, we are the world leaders. Of course we could do that. And then people would get to work in district after district. We need to help congressional candidates next year know what that means and the grassroots level. This jobs canard is so pathetic that it's not too hard to defeat. Number of coal miners in our country at the coal face, by one definition, 15,000. By another definition, 5,000. Number of oil rig workers at the oil rigs, 25,000. Even if you take the big number, 80,000 in the coal industry, that's because there are drivers and chefs and accountants that could work anywhere. This has nothing to do with the jobs lost. The jobs are going to be lost from catastrophes, environmental catastrophes, or from the loss of potential jobs in the new green industries. It's crazy. We're talking about the most capital-intensive industry, oil, gas, and coal. That's not a jobs sector. There are no jobs there. And yet, that's how it's defended. They're liars. They don't care. They're liars. So we have to call them for what they are. Just answering the facts is not enough. Explaining who Harold Hamm is and how Continental Resources funded Scott Pruitt, certainly the most useless, despicable hack that came anywhere near the EPA, just to listen to him, you know that this man absolutely is the most irresponsible person you could imagine in that position. This is a game that we're in. And they're winning the game. Because money has a big advantage. We don't have the money. We just have the truth and the votes and the people. So that's what we need to reach. Please. Thank you very much. Wanting to understand how you think the Sustainable Development Goals, which all 193 countries signed up to, might help with this planning process. I know the UN is not particularly highly regarded in the US, despite the fact that headquarters are in New York, but you have certainly been a very influential voice. Do you think that there might be some way of putting some pressure on, given that there is an annual stock take of those commitments to yep. the Sustainable Development Goals. Th thanks a lot. If you Google uh, US public opinion and UN, I'm pretty sure you'll find that the approval ratings are 65 to 70 percent consistently. In the hardcore right-wing base, no. But for the country as a whole, good. And by the way, if the United States had listened to the Security Council a few times, we would not have dropped $5 trillion in Iraq. We would not have gotten trapped in this disaster in Libya, which was a disaster made of 
three people, Sarkozy, Cameron, and Hillary Clinton, we could have avoided disasters. And so the Security Council is actually a good thing for the US because we have a way of throwing away trillions of dollars and killing lots of people. No, no, I disagree with that entirely, which is that in Syria, if you recall, after Assad cracked down on protests, the President of the United States said, Assad must go. And I looked up, because I was on a television set that moment, and I said, oh my God, here we go again. Because I'll translate that for you. If you want to know, that means that the CIA briefed the president that we can take out Assad within the next 30 days. And I'm guessing I wasn't in the room, but I've got lots of knowledge. And so they, the CIA and Saudi Arabia, decided that they would overthrow Assad. And that was in May 2011. We are now, six years later, 10 million people displaced, 500,000 deaths. Russia came in several years later. What we did was play our normal game of trying to overthrow a regime. That's the sickness of an empire, which we shouldn't be. So that's our big problem. Why is it, by the way, Trump ran on, we're not going to get entangled in all of this, and he's getting more and more entangled. We're going to now have troop increases in Afghanistan because we have a permanent state in this country. Understand it. The CIA and the military, they fight wars and sell weaponry. And it doesn't matter who's president. We had a Nobel Peace Prize winning president who continued the war in Afghanistan, made a war in Syria, made a war in Libya, uh, helped uh, enter the war in Yemen. And that's for a Nobel Peace Prize laureate. Imagine what happens when you have what we have right now. So I won't agree with that. We throw away trillions of dollars because we're a $20 trillion world economy. But we cut millions off of climate research, not because they don't believe, but because it might show something that could hinder the $96 billion of wealth of the Koch brothers. In a low carbon world, the Koch brothers' income would be like ours. You understand. So they have a good incentive to fight. They have $90 billion plus at stake. And our job is to put them out of business, let's be clear. The world does not need their refineries, especially after 2050. The world does not need ExxonMobil and Chevron, let's be clear, after mid-century, unless they become giant offshore wind producers like Statoil is going to be. Or if Klaus's technology works, great. He can save them, which we're rooting for too, by carbon capture and storage. But the point is that we're not here to keep certain people rich or to keep the military-industrial complex gainfully employed or to turn over security to generals. They're supposed to be the grown-ups in the room. Go review the Cuban Missile Crisis. Who were the grown-ups in the room? The generals? No, we would never be having our conference today had the generals had their way. The world would have ended 55 years ago. The generals had it all wrong. They know how to fight wars. They don't know how to make peace. So that's our problem. But the sustainable development goals, just to conclude if I could, sorry, and I'll, I'll just finish here. Look, the world agreed on 17 goals to end poverty, universal health coverage, universal quality education, low carbon economy, sustainable cities, protecting biodiversity. They're wonderful goals. All over the world, governments are working on them, except ours, of course. 
at the national level. I don't ever expect to hear those three words, maybe ever, I don't think sustainable is in Trump's vocabulary, but sustainable development goals I doubt will ever be stringed together except in some random weird <laughs> alt-universe. Um, but these are goals that America needs. I track, as part of a team, where America stands on these goals. We're near the bottom of the high-income world. The most inequality, our kids are not going to college at the same rate as many other countries. We're not investing in R&D anything like the top investors anymore. We are adrift, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have universal health care coverage. Our school performance is in the middle. Our mortality rates of middle-aged white non-Hispanics is rising, as you know. We've got opioid addiction, suicide epidemics. We're in trouble. So taking goals that say we're going to get ourselves out of trouble is the right way to proceed. And decarbonizing the energy system and saving nature is part of it. Now, my theory is that this is neither a Republican nor a Democratic Party agenda. This is a national agenda. My second theory is that these are all achievable goals because when I go to Norway, they don't have any of those things that I just said. They're rich. They live many years longer than we do. They don't have any poverty. They all have six weeks paid vacation. They all have maternity and paternity leave. Every kid gets quality childcare. It's a different world, but nothing that isn't within our reach as well. So I would like America to have America's goals for 2030. I think that's a viable politics. I would like to have candidates take a pledge for America's goals for 2030. I would like candidates, both Democratic and Republican, because I don't believe we're going to get out of this by the Republicans beating the Democrats or the Democrats beating the Republicans. I think we need to rethink our politics, get the lobbyists out of the back rooms, have hearings, white papers, thinking, universities, expert opinion, leading engineers helping us to find the way out. That's what we need. So I think shared America's goals for 2030 could be a very good thing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. With the Sustainability Leadership Award 2017 from the American Renewable Energy Institute. <laughs>